Great. Well, it's it's one after, and we have a lot of fantastic content today. So I'd love to uh, welcome all of you to the RIEEE webinar um, Fall 2022 series. Um, we are very excited to have a great lineup for you today, and I'm going to do a very brief introduction that um, uh, strives not to take any time away from our excellent speakers. Um, so this semester we are focusing <clears throat> on different areas where App State has um, a lot of impressive leadership and research and momentum that we can build on collectively. Um, and so today our webinar is about forestry for natural climate solutions, innovations for fall, uh, small forest owners. Um, and so we're very excited to hear uh, from four folks today. Um, RIEEE uh, serves campus by connecting, convening, supporting, amplifying research uh, that advances the sustainability mission that is a key to the university. Um, and part of that is connecting and creating um, and supporting strong collaborations with our community partners and folks outside the, um, the university too. So um, forestry for natural climate solutions uh, rose to the top because we have a lot of different exciting projects that have uh, a few different nuances you'll hear about today. Um, it's going to highlight research projects and infrastructures um, that investigate how and why small forest owners might leverage land holdings to do things like sequester carbon, um, preserve biodiversity, produce clean energy, and diversify income streams. So there's lots of different ways we can focus on what seems like a, a niche area and exciting to hear about that. Um, after this webinar, which you might be watching live or you might be watching back, um, we want to offer the opportunity for what we're calling a research roll call. So we only get to hear from um, four esteemed colleagues today, but we would like to welcome other people to the conversation to identify yourselves if you connect with this area, have something to contribute. So um, those are events to you know make new connections and spark ideas. Um, and from there, there are other follow-on steps that RIEEE is happy to help with, um, the supporting working groups, uh, maybe hosting and uh, funding a symposium to bring things together, or um, working with GRS in the Office of Research to pursue and help with specific grant opportunities. Um, so those are our objectives today. And um, without any further ado, I'm going to pass it to our uh, research development and program manager, Grace Plummer, to introduce each of our speakers um, as it's their turn. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, the format today will be about 10 minutes. We're shooting for about 10 minutes per presenter. We have four, so if we happen to have time in between for a quick question or two, we'll allow for that. Um, and then if there is time at the end, um, we could have a broader discussion across the presenters. We also have a few that are able to stay on after. So if there is some really vibrant discussion occurring, we can stay on um, past two o'clock, but we will do a close and, and end our recording and all of that before that discussion ensues. Um, so our, oh, let me get mine up to share. Sorry. Um, our first presenter today is Rick Reingen. So Rick is a professor in the Sustainable Development Department here in Appalachian, and his presentation today will focus on a collaboration that was recently funded through one of RIEEE's uh, seed funding programs, the Concert Grant Program. And I will let you start sharing your screen, Rick. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Grace. And uh, I'm actually going to, uh, so I've titled this, Can Forest Restoration Serve Farmer Needs and a Broader? Good. Um, and I'm actually going to, let me just make sure I'm sharing this correctly here. Uh, and I'm going to actually talk about uh, two different settings where I think we have some similar kind of uh, nascent research opportunities um, and some of the same questions. The one on the right is what Grace just mentioned. So this is a new RIEEE concert grant. It's really focusing on developing forest production and restoration strategies that work for marginalized communities here in Appalachia kind of the setting here. And so some of the collaborators for this are Laura England, Matt Ogwu, Dinesh Powdell, and then Jim Hamilton and County Ag Extension. Um, the one on the left is that I'm gonna talk also about, which is um, work that I'm restarting in the Atlantic lowlands of Costa Rica. And so this is for 
an NSF proposal on the emergence of complexity and biodiversity in late stage native species plantations. This is work I'm doing with Julia Showalter and a number of other external partners. And I think these have, even though these are really two different settings, I think they have some common questions. And the main one is how can we enable forest stewardship and restoration that provides broad ecological services. So carbon, biodiversity, water protection, whole set of uh, climate resilience, and also meets the needs of marginal communities. So landowners and people who might not have land as well. And so if, if we really think about the we there, there's things that we do. We do research, training, and partnership. And I think there's, there's a number of different kind of strategies or leverage points that we have within academia to do this. So we can develop and promote forest systems with multiple ecological benefits. So kind of a broad range of services facilitate expanded market access for economic goods and ecological services. So if you think about forest producing things that you can sell in a marketplace and then things that are much harder to sell, or at least in the markets that we have right now. It can also reduce barriers and increase opportunities for small producers who often have uh, struggled to, be, to participate in, um, in programs. We can research and develop enabling policies and we can also plan for climate adaptation. So I want to start by thinking a little bit just about the, the ecology of some of these pieces about kind of production and biodiversity. And, and because the, the um, my kind of basic question there kind of implies that there's some trade-offs between different ecological services, so carbon, biodiversity, and farmers' needs. And at the surface, we might think that those don't have to be in conflict, that we could have carbon, biodiversity, farmers' needs in the same way. And there's actually, I'm just looking at the panel on the, the left, which is a kind of meta-analysis that appeared in science about a year or so ago. This is actually true. If we look at forests across a lot of space, we find that richer, more biodiverse forests are more productive. Now, this is a lot of, there's a lot of uh, caveats to this, but in general, the more diverse a forest is, the richer the species, the, the, the better, um, the more it produces ecologically. And this kind of is about different species taking up different niches within an environment, different parts of soil, different parts, getting different parts of um, light, uh, different, being able to access water in different ways. And so this makes sense. So this kind of suggests maybe there isn't a trade-off. We could get diverse and productive forests at the same time. So it doesn't always work that way, though. If we look on the right, there's actually one of my favorite pa papers by Eugene Odom, so a North Carolinian um, ecologist, about what happens through forest succession and development. And this is just, I just want to think about the top one. The bottom one is a different kind of model, but the top one is forest succession. And so he kind of argues that if we look over kind of whether it's reforestation or a kind of a, a forest coming into a new area, what happens is it goes through a period of time where productivity and kind of uh, growth is high, and then slowly um, respiration catches up, right? And we end up going through a, an early phase of really fast net primary productivity that's way that peaks earlier, much earlier than biomass peaks. And so, um, and we can, we're going to talk a little bit about why this might not exactly work, but, but in most managed ecosystems, what we do is we don't wait to get out here, we stop early. We basically, we find the place where we get to the peak of net primary productivity with, and, and what that results in is first shorter rotations in forestry, and it also results in um, a selection of species that do, that grow really well in that niche. So we, so we create management systems that tend to go up here, and before they really peak, we cut them down, we grow them back up, we cut them down, we grow them back up, right? So that's really important because Odom suggested that actually in the development of systems, you get an early phase of, um, sorry, I'll do this, uh, do it this way, sorry. Um, you get an early phase of higher um, biodiversity, then biodiversity kind of goes down, and then it's only later that it starts to go up. So if we looked at the graph on the left, in mature forests, we get this, you can have high productivity and high biodiversity, but really we tend to manage systems to be more productive and less biodiverse. So we tend to we tend to kind of stay at the on the left hand side of this. Okay. So that's so so we choose our markets and our preferences make us essentially create a trade-off between producti productivity and biodiversity. Oops, let's see if we can hmm. 
Okay. Um, I want to just say there's another, there's other versions of this ecological model. So Odom knew a lot, but he didn't know everything. And it turns out in a lot of early successional forest systems, they actually don't just approach that asymptote, that carrying capacity. They actually go through an early phase of what gets described as boom and bust. You get forests that become really, really productive before they have to head back towards that carrying capacity. There's lots of questions about whether that peaks at the same points or if it could peak at different points. But this is important for, for our work in Costa Rica in particular. We're really interested in this spot where you get overshoot, where you get systems that are almost too productive. They're not necessarily economically productive, but they create a lot of potential habitat and resources for biodiversity to emerge. And so that's part of what we're, we're trying to do. So a little bit of my two snapshots. So Costa Rica, Costa Rica between the 1940s and the 1980s lost about 80% of its forest. We think of it now as this great ecotourist destination. Wasn't always the case. 80% it's for a combination of timber, cattle, bananas, and now pineapple are the kind of leading drivers. Starting the late 1980s and early 90s, there were a lot of efforts to protect forests and to restore forests through, uh, through reforestation. Um, this is work that I did um, now 30 years ago on, on different aspects of this. And so basically people looked at using native species to reforest degraded pastures. And I, I think of the Appalachian version of this is, is former cattle um, pastures or even uh, Christmas tree uh, farms as well. One of the lessons from this is that these forests actually become, even though they look relatively uniform and homogeneous, they can actually be a place for new biodiversity to accumulate. The other thing is there are ways, this is the paper on the right, there are ways to think about farmers' needs, and especially small farmers. Small farmers can't afford to reforest and wait for 30 years to harvest or to be able to, to find other ways to get returns. They need short-term returns, and we, we need to design options that are appropriate for that. And so that's kind of, that's the framework for this. You, we need to find ways to make it work for small producers. Costa Rica has done great work on creating policies that support payment for environmental services, but in general, you need a good deal of land to be able to take advantage of them. And what you get back works for you if you're already going to keep your forest. It doesn't really make you want to turn something that could be a pineapple farm into a forest. Okay, I just want to kind of touch on a little bit, again, this is back this um, the Paralari, this paper, this, this idea of this overshoot, right, is really kind of important. And, and so these are two pictures of plots that I planted for, for my dissertation and what they look like right now. So this is 30 years later. These, these, these are now forests. These are emerging forests. So this was an old degraded pasture. This tree is, I'm pretty sure, is this tree here. I'm almost exactly, it's the same one. Sure, it's the same one. And they clearly are experiencing overshoot. They have about twice or three times the basal area of natural forest or um, 45 to 50 year old secondary forests. And these trees are now dying and creating diverse habitat. There is, there's carbon here for sure. And it's likely to go down its little bust cycle, but there's also biodiversity. And so we're really interested in ecologically how this overshoot process creates up here essentially a bump or an opportunity for the emergence of structural complexity and biodiversity. Okay, so that's what we're really interested in. We can think about it in that in different, different ways, think about it from the perspective of a young plant trying to grow up. We can think about it in different ways, but these are becoming diverse forests. They're no longer uniform plantations. So you can ask, so what does that have to do with thinking about what's going to work for farmers. We can, we can create these markets, but we need to really ask, how can we create economic value from biodiversity and social equity? So for this work that we're doing, we're proposing for NSF, we have two partners that I'm really excited about. On the left is Regen Network. So this is a, um, so basically what they do is they create um, both methodologies and then they run a ledger for blockchain-based trading of environmental services. They've already developed methodologies for carbon, but they're really interested in developing what they consider carbon plus. So measuring efficiently, cost efficiently measuring biodiversity and social benefits. 
So for small farmers, that's a challenge. How do I do this? If I, if I had a thousand acres and get a forester to come out and do a survey, not a problem. I need quick ways to be able to do this. So looking at how to, um, that's part of our goal. One of our other partners is a group called Rainforest Connection. Rainforest Connection focuses on doing passive acoustic monitoring. So listening to forests. They started off by doing this to um, mitigate threat, uh, to, to do threat detection and mitigation. Listen for chainsaws, listen for guns, poachers and sawyers, right? Now what they're doing is they're developing a platform for listening to the forest and identifying biodiversity. This is really important because this becomes a way, you could actually, a simple monitoring device can be placed in a, for, in a small farmer's forest and we can listen for what's there, howler monkeys, uh, birds, bats, uh, frogs, and you could pull this out without a lot of cost. So that idea of developing, having the technology and then the way to trade in those um, is really important. I'm gonna keep moving. I'm gonna jump back to Appalachia for a minute. Uh, I'll try to do this one too. So this is closer to home. Um, this is on the left is the Vinoy family farm, which makes up part of the university's Blackburn Vinoy estate. I, I'm willing to guess, I know Jim's been out there. I'm not sure, maybe Tatiana is too actually, but not everybody goes out here. It's, I gotta say, so this is, um, so this is it on the left. Uh, there's another half of the farm of the estate as well. Uh, in the middle here is the 1948 aerial photo. I should have done an outline, but you can kind of see it here. There are a lot of the areas of this farm have been first pasture and then Christmas trees. For the last hundred years, most of this land has been worked. Um, and it's not the same. Coming back after a hundred years of work is not the same as, um, as doing it. So I want us to think a little bit about alternative strategies for using the forest out there, but also think about this from what are the strategies that farmers might use as well. Okay, so that's what I want to be thinking of. This is this is taken, and if you could see it, this is taken from this spot right here. And if you see my cursor, this spot on the Benoit farm, it's in the middle of what was a Christmas tree farm. There's not much regeneration. There's some milkweed, goldenrod, different things coming up. And then there's kind of a fairly rich, although overcut forest in the background. There are farms have different environments and different kinds of alternative solutions are going to work for them. Okay. I just want to give a sorry a quick time check that we're a couple minutes over. Let's okay. All right. I'm going to go faster, Grace. I'm going to try to do it. <laughs> we're squeezing a lot into an hour. Okay. I'm going to now take us up to here. This is right at the northern border of the of the Vinoy property, and that's where we are, where I'm standing when I took this picture yesterday. This is at the, the edge of our farm and our neighbor, Donnie Weinberger. It's Donnie on the right and his neighbor, Grace, on the left. Um, they are, uh, so they're standing behind a pile of heart nuts. Heart nuts are not native to our, our forests here. They're a relative of walnuts, but they're one of many nuts that grow here. Um, Donnie also grows butternut, hickories for, uh, for nuts as well. And he grew up from one tree that's on right on the boundary between our land and his land. Um, but it's a really interesting example of, of, of farmers thinking about alternative forest uses. There's a heart nut, um, much easier to crack than a walnut. He also grows out um, regeneration of this as well. The reason I really like this is because it, it suggests so that one of the, one of the key, fo the key uh, focus areas for this work that we're doing is looking at ways to both restore forests that are economically viable for producers. There, our forests are higher in nuts uh, and other fruits, but nuts than most forests. They've been selected over millennia to be this way, but there's a lot more out there. We can't grow lots of just one species of, or one variety of heart nuts. There are lots of varieties of these that are out there. Thinking about different varieties that would work here is an important part of this. I'm almost there. I think this is also a great opportunity to think about a vision for this forest and this as a university asset. Um, we can think about developing interdisciplinary research, training and outreach that really facilitates just and sustainable transition for our community and our region. And we think about forest and agroforest restoration and production that sequesters carbon, promotes biodiversity and strengthens a local economy. I'll just end with this. There are lots of questions here. 
We don't know a lot about what's happening in the soil after it's been used in the way it has for a long period of time. We, there's a lot to learn about different fruit and tree combinations and what other species might be a part of it and how they fit into a farm landscape. And then lastly, there's a lot to be learned about how this works, not just at a farm level, but at a community level. What does it take? What kind of collaboration is needed to be able to support that? So I'm gonna stop there. Thanks for letting me run over, Grace. Thank you, Rick, for trying very hard to fit a lot into a short amount of time. We will hold questions though and move on to Jim. And actually we might, the between um, uh, speaker questions, we might hold since there are a few that could stay afterward for some conversation and we'll try to keep ourselves into this hour. Um, so Jim Hamilton is the County Extension Director of the Watauga County Center and sometimes teaches in the Sustainable Development Department as well. He specializes in forestry and agroforestry and he'll focus today on ginseng production. I'll hand it over to Jim, thank you. All right, thanks Grace. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and, and, and yeah, ginseng gets the lion's share of the, the attention when it comes to forest farming, but um, you know, forest farming as an option for small scale or even large scale forest landowners is, is out there for, um, for a number of reasons. Um, forest farming is the production of a, of a, of a crop, either agricultural or, or non-timber forest product crop, basically using the the canopy of the forest for shade for, uh, you know, in a more you know, commercial or industrial production scale of shade grown um, uh, crops, you know, we rely these days a lot on, on, on structures and shade cloth, but we have lots of natural forests here and especially, you know, here in the Western North Carolina mountains, we do have the ideal growing conditions for a lot of the forest medicinal herbs that are sort of having a renaissance of, of interest in the nutraceutical and, and health industries. Um, we have a lot of underutilized forest lands in our, our county. We have lots of, of forest landowners who really just view the, their forest for uh, aesthetic or wildlife or recreational purposes. Uh, based on the, the, the price or the cost of real estate these days, um, it makes more sense to, to just to keep the forest as is instead of uh, clear cutting it and letting it sit, sit, you know, uh, very rough looking for anywhere from 50 to 70 years to return to its natural state. So many forest landowners opt to keep their, their forest lands intact more and more. But there is a way to get something out of that underutilized land as well. We've got uh, plenty of great growing sites for a lot of the forest medicinal plants that we have. Uh, the slopes that we that we have here in the mountains uh, provide for, for good drainage. Uh, for a lot of the crops that are valued um, as uh, forest medicinals, uh, the temperature and weather that we have here with, with fluctuating cold and cold and warm seasons, temperate, uh, temperate climate uh, makes for ideal growing conditions. And, and traditionally, the, our, you know, the forebears here in the mountains relied on uh, a thriving medicinal herb industry for for uh, for income. I just went to a talk last night at the Belk Library from Luke Manjay, a historian who who really dug into the uh, literally dug into the history of of ginseng uh, by looking at, at at old ledgers and tracking where the old uh, uh, dealer locations were and how much volume came out of the mountains uh, is pretty staggering because you know. These days we have a CVS and a Walgreens on every corner. You know, back in the day, you know, if you had hemorrhoids, you went up to you went up to Witch Hazel Holler and and uh, and got you some you know plants to to uh, to help fix your you know, the, the the ills that affected you. And we still have a lot of of wild harvesting of of ginseng and some foraging for other plants today. So this still is a very active part of of Appalachian culture and landowners who historically or generationally have owned land, have known about these resources, and that knowledge has been passed down, you know, from, uh, from, from generation to generation, year after year, but it is still, it is still active, and ginseng does get the lion's share, like I said, of the attention when it comes to uh, forest farming or producing a crop under the canopy, um, basically due to the price. Uh, in 2013, ginseng hit an all-time high, all-time high of about $1,300 a pound, Ginseng is traded like any other global commodity. It's, it's about the same as pork bellies or soybean or 
soybeans or orange juice or corn. It, it, it's, it's a supply and demand based um, industry, uh, primarily going to Asia. Uh, about 95% of the ginseng that is wild harvested or even grown here in the U.S. is exported to, to Asia and it, where it's used um, in traditional med, uh, medicinal practices for energy. Uh, lately, you've seen a lot, a lot of products with, uh, with ginseng um, in, in commercial products, you know, Lipton iced tea with ginseng. You've got the Sobe energy drinks that have ginseng. The little yellow jacket trucker pills they sell at the Circle K and the Speedways have ginseng in there all for energy. Um, and, and there are a lot of other herbal and nutraceutical products uh, that, that are, um, that include other medicinal herbs and forest herbs that can be grown under the canopy. And, you know, the benefits of maintaining that canopy, as Rick said, for the longer term is actually, you know, you end up with a much more diverse forest. It, it is still productive, but not just in the trees themselves, but in what you can produce under the canopy. Um, how these nutraceutical crops are grown affects their, their value especially for ginseng. And for ginseng, there's over 50 different grades. Once, once roots get shipped to China, they have a grading guild that will sit and grade out ginseng into over 50 different grades. But there, there have been a lot of studies on, uh, on how much more, uh, I guess, potent or medic medicinally effective that uh, these forest and herbal crops grown in a canopy are compared to those that are grown, uh, grown more agriculturally or with commercial practices with lots of you know fertilizer and other chemical in inputs and customers too are sort of driving uh, a more uh, forest grown or more sustainably harvested and stewarded crop so you have companies like mountain rose herbs out in on the west coast um, who require their producers to to have forest grown certifications for some of their um, some of their uh, forest farmed products uh, the companion plants of ginseng uh, also have commercial value. They're not nearly as valuable dollar-wise, but you take a, a plant like Ramps, which has really gained a lot of uh, a lot of kudos in the culinary world uh, recently. I mean, everyone goes nuts over ramp season in um, in in April and May. You know, here in the mountains, uh, Golden Seal uh, peaked last year at around $115 a pound. I think right now currently it's selling for about $85 a pound. Uh, blue and black cohosh also have a market and depending on how they're grown or, or which company is buying them, uh, the values of those crops can change, but they all grow well together. And that's, that's the potential of really sort of expanding the potential for forest farming here in our, in Western North Carolina. When I'm in the woods and I see bloodroot and, and blue cohosh and trillium together, there's probably ginseng there. And if it's not there, somebody already got it more than likely because they do grow very well together. So there's a lot of potential. And in even you know with, with, low, with very low inputs, you can successfully steward and manage and produce some of these, some of these crops. So if you don't have the money to invest in a large scale forest farming operation, you can start. You you can start with a few seed, a few roots, a few a few starts, and plant you out plant these in 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 forest land that is is amenable. I'm I'm not saying that every piece of of forest land here in the mountains is is suitable for high quality medicinal herb uh, herb and plant production, but we do have uh, we do have a lot of those areas. And um, if they're not being used for you know if the if the lands really aren't uh, prioritized for timber, then these uh, forest medicinal crops can be integrated as a shorter term crop. Um, that said, there are there are some some growers here that are really producing uh, uh, high volume forest farmed crop. This is a uh, this is a woods grown ginseng operation here in the county from a few years ago. Um, most of these roots have have already been harvested. Well, half harvested about half stolen so it doesn't look nearly as, as good as it does here in rows but you can see that they're, they're being they were interplanted with uh within a pine stand that will eventually be harvested so there's that you know multiple use and in, in true uh forest farming and, and agroforestry system in play um site selection and the site preparation it's it's you can go very low input uh, it's still to, to to sort of optimize what you can grow under the forest 
Um, there is some site prep involved, but that can be as low maintenance as the photo on the left or as intensive as the photo on, on the right. It just depends on you know, the means and the willpower and the sweat equity that the landowner is willing to put into uh, some sort of forest farming. But I will, uh, I will stop there. If anyone has, we might have make time for a question or two if someone has one for Jim. The Zoom silence. Yep. <laughs> On a Friday, especially. Thank you. Okay, so our next speaker is Tatiana Riseva. She is an associate professor in political science and the graduate program director in the government and justice studies department. Uh, Tatiana is a member of the Appalachian Carbon Research Group, which has collaborated through our IEEE for some time now. Um, and her presentation today will focus on the title you see in front of you. <laughs> Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you, Grace, and happy to be here. Um, I'm going to turn it off, or switch from the woods, get out of the woods, and and bring us to the sort of conference tables and where rules are being made about how how we can quantify and trade uh, carbon and um, as Grace mentioned, I've been working with Appalachian Carbon Group for the last several years. So much of this work that I'm going to share with you today uh, comes out of, of those co collaborations. Um, and so we started back in 2015, I believe, looking at California's market, uh, carbon offset program and carbon market. Since um, <clears throat> 2013, California has authorized the use of offset. So currently it's the largest largest subnational um, offset crediting mechanism. Um, and offsets from forest lands represent about 80%, if not more of all offsets issued by the um, California Air Resources Board. So these are the questions that we've been looking at all the time. Um, I apologize if there's background noise, I'm on campus and the band is uh, in my background. So if you're hearing that, it's uh, part of the campus activities. Um, so as of last year, um, there were 147 projects that were issued uh, forest offsets that, were, that are eligible for uh, participation on the California market. And you can see sort of the uh, regional concentrations where these projects are with North Carolina having six of these projects. So unpacking those six projects, um, these are forest um, conservation or improved forest management projects. Um, and together they are a little over 9,000 acres in terms of uh, sort of the, the overall uh, scope or scale of participation. The last project, the seventh one on the very bottom is a wetland restoration project. And the list here is at the very end, the last column. So it tells you that we have fairly limited experience with these projects so far. And most of these are sort of on the east side of the state, nothing here in our uh, neck of the woods. Um, so back to the question about effectiveness. Again, this comes out of a paper that um, we um, put together a few years back. We can be thinking about the overall effectiveness of the program as overall carbon storage. So that will be the green line here on the graph. And that will be a function of both the number or the quantity of projects, but also their quality. Um, and obviously there's a trade-off among those two relative to how stringent the standards for offsets are. And the key or dominant standards so far have been permanence sort of the reliability of carbon storage over time, but also the additionality of these activities, right? There has been a lot of criticism, lots of criticisms about uh, sort of the integrity of offsets and whether they really represent um, uh, you know, legitimate climate benefits. Um, and again, you can see that, you know, if we want a lot of participation, um, right, uh, certainly, there would be that trade-off in terms of effectiveness, but also in terms of the integrity of offsets. Um, but there are, <laughs> there are recent developments. In fact, last year, 2021, was sort of a pivotal year for carbon markets globally. Um, you know, China's market, and then there's the Glasgow um, climate talks meeting 
kind of uh, fueled life in carbon markets in terms of the rules on the Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. And certainly that, that ever baits. And we see a slow sort of creeping increase in terms of the offset prices. Um, they were between 13 and 15 in the last few years, now creeping up to $21 uh, per offset. But still there are some sort of, uh, uh, you know, deficiencies in terms of how the market operates. And currently there's no uh, accurate or good adequate price signaling and information sharing between sort of the suppliers, right, the producers and the buyers of offsets in terms of just California talking about a compliance or regulatory market. Um, and these projects are costly, particularly for small scale forest owners. And there are long-term monitoring, reporting and verification costs they're really vary by scale. Um, and most recently, as of last year, there's a requirement for direct environmental benefits to the state or DEBS at the very bottom here, um, which basically says now, as you're using offsets, make sure that 50% of these offsets that you are submitting come with direct environmental benefits to the state of California. And that's something to be interpreted by the California Air Resources Board kind of a gray area. And you can see here the sort of the distinction between offsets with DEBS, the blue column, section of the column or the bars, and, and then the green ones. There is going to be a deficiency or sort of shortage in terms of these direct environmental benefits or DEBS offsets. Um, what this basically says is California stepping forward and saying, we prioritize projects, forest projects in California or neighboring states such as Oregon or Washington. And in terms of opportunities, right? What are these um, recent developments telling as well? Um, most of all, the demand is going to be sort of um, exceeding supply and both public and private developments sort of actors stepping forward in terms of their climate commitments. You can see the course here, this is international aviation offset scheme that, uh, that was launched last year. A lot of private companies and um, big names here um, pledging close to $7 million for family forest carbon projects. That's uh, Amazon, um, not listed. Well, it's listed here. And, and most recently, there are sort of these linkages with other sector, sectors. So thinking of how state utilities in North Carolina might um, use offsets from working lands, from natural and working lands in the state kind of meet their uh, emission reduction goals. Uh, I think there was a, um, there were hearings with Duke this, this week going on, talking about affordability and reliability. And so there are a lot of interesting um, sort of stepping points uh, from which we can talk about how to utilize the capacity of these forest lands to meet climate commitments throughout various um, sectors. The Transportation Climate Initiative, TCI, something happening already in the Northeast. And they're talking about the use of offsets as well. Excuse me. So in terms of small forest uh, landowners and what their possibilities are, the compliance regulatory carbon market, we know by now is, is sort of a, a limited uh, stage for them, but there have been a lot of diffusion, innovation learning by other actors. So the TNC, um, the Nature Conservancy and American Forest Foundation, launched their family forest carbon program still in the early stages, but um, coming to North Carolina as of this fall, the natural capital exchange. Again, uh, if you are using your land for multiple purposes, including harvesting, you can also defer harvest and get paid alternatively for, for the stored carbon or avoided um, emissions. Um, finite, car finite carbon um, has a new program, again, for smaller uh, forest landowners launched last summer. In our region, not a lot happening, but there's a program in Tennessee that uses, uh, works with land trusts and um, aggregates uh, projects to, for participation on the voluntary market. And that's the Appalachian Carbon Exchange. Um, and certainly there's diffusion in terms of the regional sort of policies. Washington um, passed legislation last year. Their cap and invest program is going to use offsets and they have a working group that's going to um, see how to incorporate small-scale forest lands and including tribal lands. Um, so what do we know about our 
poorest owners in, in North Carolina. We did a small survey here with a graduate student in 2019, building off of that, we'll be launching another one. Um, so quickly, what we know from that survey, it's a small sample, as you can see, um, only about uh, 200 valid responses in the average acreage for these participants, respondents was about 100 um, acres between 20 and up to 7,000 acres is what uh, these individuals noted they own. Um, all right, so we asked them, what amount of land are you willing, um, what amount of land would you enroll in a carbon program um, relative to sort of income? And we defined that as income from a timber management strategy standpoint. Um, so about two thirds, 64% here, would say I'll enroll half or more, at least half or more of my land uh, in a forest carbon program if it provides the same income relative to timber timber management. And then we asked them about the contract link. Um, so thinking about the various scenarios that these programs out there are presenting uh, participants with. So we had 15, 40, and 100 years as scenarios. And 70%, so this is the majority, of participants said, again, we'll enroll half or more of the land if it's a shorter program, 15 years. And that's still fairly large or fairly long period if you compare that to federal uh, programs that are you know, like the Conservation Reserve Program that's five years long um, in terms of contracts. Um, and then finally, how does it fit with their management objectives, right? The goals for owning land. Um, and as uh, Jim mentioned, most of of forest, most of the forest owners here in, in Appalachia value those lands for recreational, for aesthetic, for sort of, um, uh, you know, wildlife and biodiversity or, or other amenities um, and types of values. And when you think about the financial sort of investment component and carbon storage, those are very, very low on, on the priority scale. Um, and just summing up here in terms of what we know from the survey that informs the next steps that we are currently working on, um, forest and nature conservation matters, shorter contracts matter, and income does play a role. Um, but there's a, a sort of a need for more information, education, technical assistance. Um, and you can see that most of the people in their open comments said, we need more information and we, we care about how how we manage the land for, for future generations in terms of inheritance and successional uh, succession of the land. Um, so Tammy um, and I and a few others uh, are planning a series of interviews, including a quantitative uh, survey, hoping this would be sort of an experimental choice uh, type, um, uh, an experimental survey where we'll randomize participants into nine groups relative to um, sort of three commitment periods and three income levels from no income, right, to kind of variable income based on, on the market dynamics and from no commitment to multiple years. Um, and this is part of a project that is funded um, by the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities. Uh, we're working with Penn State, uh, the PI, Melissa Cry is at Penn State and it's a state extension in Clemson, Clemson University looking at wide, widely here thinking of the social and economic impacts of carbon markets in the Eastern including Southern United States. Um, and I'll skip the slide, Tammy can touch more on the interviews um, that we are planning with, with participant stakeholders uh, on, in the carbon market. But thank you so much, uh, everyone. And I'll stop sharing here. I know because he has to jump off, I wanted to try to get to this quickly, um, or he has to jump off soon, that where might a landowner find some information about enrollment or qualification? And if that's a lengthy answer, maybe there's, I can pass something along or... Quickly, there are two publications on the NC State Extension website, and I'm happy to send the links to those. And there's summaries, and the, there's a list of developers and sort of the, the options out there, but I'm happy to pass those along. Excellent. So there's there's not there's not a one stop shop where where a home where a landowner can go. That I guess that was my question. I know in NC State had <laughs> I need to know about those resources. So but I know they they have resources on potentials, but I, you mentioned a program that will you know pay you know, pay landowners. And that's, 
it's, I, I think education and awareness and the willingness and the bandwidth of a, of a landowner, uh, to, you know, to put that kind of effort to track something down is a, is a barrier or is a, is a concern. I just, I thought that this was, maybe there was a, you know, you had a, had, had a link or list of qualifications for enrollment for one program. That's all I was asking. The clauses that I can um, offer as an answer would be a carbon developer, right? So blue source. And they would they would navigate all of those. Thank you. Um, I see some questions, maybe other questions coming up, but we'll hold these until we get through Tammy's presentation, and then some of the speakers can stay on for some conversation after. So if you don't mind to hold your questions, um, our next speaker is Tammy Kowalczyk. She's a professor in the accounting department, where she teaches courses on sustainable business practices and directs the Appalachian Impact Clinic. Tammy's also a member of the Appalachian Carbon Research Group with Tatiana and some others on the call. And her presentation today will focus on the role of private sector financing in carbon offset programs. Thank you, Tammy. Hey everybody, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen real fast and um, get started. I'm sure most of you don't know me are probably wondering how in the world did the accounting professor get in here, but um, we uh, can you guys see my screen? Can you see the slide? Okay, great, thanks. So um, so I've worked with Tatiana for a long time and uh, as well as Greg Marlin and ever others in the carbon research group. And it was, um, I got kind of involved with this because I think there was a discussion that really started on, you know, what drives carbon accounting and, and the need for um, um, the carbon markets and the success of carbon markets is really driven by those who want to buy carbon credits. And uh, to scale that, you really need a lot of buyers. And what's driving this to a great extent is um, the fact that, uh, particularly in recent years, there is a rising focus on uh, corporate carbon footprints and, and emission reduction strategy. Um, I would say, after having taught this over 15 years in the business sector, um, climate disclosure and um, carbon footprints and sustainability reports and the new buzzword is ESG reports and things. And this is just, you uh, are hard pressed to find a company that isn't considering this anymore. And so it's very heartening for those of us that have been sort of um, saying this is a really good idea for a long time. And so... What's happening now is there's a, a, a focus on actually being accountable for these emission reduction targets that companies are setting, so much so that uh, what's what's driving it to a great extent is the fact that um, the Securities Exchange Commission stock exchanges, as well as European stock exchanges, and uh, really across the globe are starting to actually ask companies to disclose their actual emissions, not just talk about what they're doing and set you know, get the news and get the press on the great things they're trying to do, they're actually saying, okay, well, if you say you're going to do this, what are you doing to get this done? And so this is putting an enormous amount of pressure for companies to really start developing a strategy that they can be held to account. And so um, the other, on the flip side of that, this is also um, driving a lot of private investment in sustainability, but particularly in natural climate solutions, which has long been a part of sort of the environmental piece of sustainability, or the, now the buzzword is ESG, environmental, social, and governance. And um, what we don't know, though, we've done a lot of studies really on landowner preferences and how to incentivize landowners to participate in forest carbon programs and what are the barriers and for the most part, we've long thought it happened, to, it must be uh, financial. Um, and to a great extent, it probably is. But the reality of it is, it's it's actually, where are the opportunities to do that? It's easy to maybe engage in some other um, activities that produce alternative revenue streams like non-timber forest products or even timber forest products for that matter. But getting into a, a, a forest carbon program for family, smaller family forest private, you know, private owners, are it, it's it's really not that easy, um, and part of that has to do with just not having uh, as many things to choose from. So we know that this is an interest to investors; they want to invest in this uh, in these activities, 
And in fact, so much so that um, sustainable forestry is now an ESG in impact investment theme. And so we need investment opportunities uh, for these for these folks. And this is very exciting, really, because it can help to develop some of these projects for uh, and scale them. Uh, Tatiana already talked about forest carbon markets. And so I want to just touch on how this is connected. Um, meeting carbon footprint goals, as I just mentioned, is going to drive participation in carbon markets and the purchase of offsets. And But what we don't know and why we want to do research in this area is how much of this is sort of a preference for forced carbon offsets. There are lots of different options and ways to um, um, purchase, you know, different types of carbon credits. There's also a, an indication that rising carbon prices will provide higher returns for those that are investing in, in, in funds that, that um, get proceeds essentially from the sale of carbon offsets. And so with this demand for forced carbon offsets, there's a study that's been done and it's expected that the demand will exceed the supply by 2025. That is not very far off. This study was done not very long ago. So we know that we need, we have a market and we need to fill this gap. The supply essentially of these forced carbon offsets has to come from forest land and there is a significant amount of forest land owned by private forest owners. More so the, the indication in blue, this is from the National Woodland Owners Survey. Um, there's a, and this is not a mystery, we know that a good chunk of this is in the East Coast and particularly in the Southeast. This is actual acreage owned by family forest owners. And this is as a percentage of total forest land in a particular area or state, this is the percentage that is owned by smaller and family forest private owners. You can see again, we are in the thick of where there's greatest opportunity to try to tap that potential for converting these forests to carbon producing forests. But we have on the flip side, as Tatiana just mentioned to you, we have where this isn't actually what's driving forest land ownership. So the owners will, want the land, but they don't necessarily own it to participate in forest mar uh, carbon markets or for the most part to actually produce investment income. They just essentially want to be able to own the property for their own purposes. And so what this suggests is, is that it might be difficult to incentivize them through financial incentives. Um, but if they, if we can, it has to be meaningful. In other words, how do we get them to go above and beyond their current management effort. Um, and for the most part, a lot of times that's gonna have to do with some sort of financial incentive beyond just I'm doing the right thing. Um, we know there's a lot of landowners that have been incentivized to do something with their property through timber management. There's a, there are landowners who participate in what they call these present use value programs. And so that's nice. And there's a, there's a certain percentage of those that do that but it does require harvesting. There are alternative revenue streams as Jim talked about ginseng and other opportunities. Um, and we know that there have long been these cost share at state or federal level cost share programs for forest conservation uh, through the PEV programs or wildlife habitat or other types of conservation type programs, even conservation easements. But those two are not necessarily always compatible with um, forest carbon programs and participation in those. So there's also some income tax credits and loan guarantees that are uh, proposed or available for investing in the development of forest carbon programs. There was a really exciting act that came out a couple of years ago called the Rural Forest Markets Act, um, but that uh, didn't progress, but it was very exciting because it would have incentivized investment in these types of programs. And so, well, where are we now is if financial return and increasing carbon storage are not primary drivers for forced landowners, how do we incentivize participation? And so the bottom line essentially, and a lot of this is coming through with the studies that we've been doing, is that really participation must be easy, it must be cost effective, and the barriers to enter must be must be relatively low, which means if you're going to put in more effort, it needs to be, you know, financially lucrative. 
programs like the nat the natural capital exchange are nice because uh, if you are already harvesting, deferring a harvest is all you have to do to be able to participate. But the fact of the matter is, according to the Woodland Owners Association, about 10% on the average of forest owners are actually are actually harvesting. So there's a large number of forest landowners that can't participate in that exchange. So what we have to do then, bottom line, is in thinking about, we need to find out what private sector funding is available and what how to incentivize that to increase it. But on the flip side, we also need to be able to bring those landowners to the table, make participation easy and financially lucrative for them to increase their management effort. That's it. <laughs> Um, just on time too. So we, some of you weren't here at the very beginning, um, but we are seeing these webinar series this fall or this webinar series this fall as a, a step in a sequence of events whereby we can support research development outcomes. And one of the ways that we can do that is to gather people around a topic like we're doing today and then move to a research roll call. We just had one a few weeks ago on climate and atmospheric science. We may, if there's interest, we may um, hold one around this topic area too. So I'm gonna release a quick poll. And while you're looking at your calendar to um, see if either of these dates work for you, either or both, you can also kind of look at these. I'll just kind of talk through the things on this slide, <clears throat> which are some upcoming events and deadlines. So we have two more sessions in this fall webinar series, uh, this next one on Friday, October 28th, and the third, December 2nd, and those two will focus on the topics here. Um, we also have two solicitations that are out right now for some of the next steps that could come from an event like this or other work that you're um, working on or as a follow on to the research roll call. Um, and those, I'll drop these in the chat. We have a solicitation out for um, a concert catalyst program, which is support both staff time and some limited funding to launch a research working group or to host, convene a research symposium in the spring semester. So both of those solicitations are there. Um, and I also added that the fall um, URC RFP is also out right now. And I'll end the poll and turn it back over to Christine and hopefully we can land this on the hour and some, oh, some of the presenters can stay on. So we'll be able to do that in just a moment. All right, well, thank you, Grace, um, for all of that uh, awesome moderation and information you dropped in. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Everything you're doing is so fascinating. Um, and I know that I learned a lot. Uh, this is really wonderful. So um, this is the end of the recorded part of uh, our webinar. Um, and I think if we stop recording, then we will say goodbye to some people, but several of our speakers has have uh, made their time available to stick around for some more interactive, informal Q and A around these things. So um, I guess round of applause though, before that, thank you so much for presenting everybody.